Greetings, everyone, and welcome once again to the book reading from Gipp's Understandable History of the Bible by Samuel C. Gipp, THD. And this is the cover of the old book. This is, I'm not sure what printing uh, this is. Um, don't remember. I'll have to look at here uh, really quick. So let me get you the printing here. Uh, this has been printed a few more times, I'm sure. So this is the third printing, which was uh, 2004, and it has been updated since then. So you can either get this one or get the updated version and uh, read the updated version there. I'm sure he's probably added some stuff to it since then. But I'm reading this edition because this is the one I have. So we've been going through Chapter 9, the authorized version, and we've been going over these men that um, have written... Um, the modern, um, let's see here, hold on a second, uh, this is titled uh, Modern Scholarship, this is what we're going through right now, and so it's been a, a few months since I last read the book, so we're going over these different men that uh, were part of the modern scholarship here, so if you missed any of these, you can go back and watch them in the playlist on YouTube, so that's how I'm um, uploading them on YouTube and then sharing them on Facebook that way, so we're going to continue today on these men that uh, were part of the modern scholarship here that Brother uh, Gip writes about. So, um, again, this is the cover of the book, and we're going to get started here on that in a, a few minutes. But first, I'd like to greet you, as always, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he, too, can be your Lord and Savior today if he's not already. And that's the most important thing you can ever do is trust Jesus Believe on him and he'll wash away all your sin, give you eternal life, and then he'll uh, dwell inside your soul and, and help you and guide you and direct you in all truth and rule and reign in your heart as you allow him to. So make sure you get saved today. And if you're saved already, hope that this uh, broadcast will be a help and blessing to you as we're continuing on through Gip's Understandable History of the Bible by Brother Sam Gip. So amen. And we left off here last time on page 340. And we're going to start here with Arthur uh, Farstad and read about him and then continue on and we'll see how far we get today on uh, today's broadcast and um, this is a uh, still a lot of pages left on um, this particular chapter chapter 9 of the authorized version so let's go ahead and get started here and continue on on the uh, modern scholarship with Arthur Farstad and page 340 of this copy of the book and brother Gibbs Gip writes here uh, Dr. Farstad was the head of the New King James Version Committee. So he was the head of the New King James Version Committee. And it says, unlike the others on his side of the uh, dais, Dr. Farstad takes a stand much closer to the King James Bible in that he rejects the supposed supremacy of the modern uh, Nestle Novum Testamentum uh, Great, great to see, and supports the majesty, or excuse me, the majority uh, text of the King James Bible. This caused some anxious moments for his uh, side, his side, um, and when he abandoned attacks on the King James Bible advocates present and turned to criticize the handling of the last 12 verses of Mark by the NASV and the NIV. And then he writes on here, my personal observation, he says, and determination concerning Dr. Farstad is that he is a humble man who truly loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen for that. He says, I believe that he truly thought he was helping Bible believers when he headed the New King James translation. He simply lacked understanding of the militant jealousy that Bible believers have for their Bible Following the debate, he came over to me and stated in apologetic embarrassment, I'm sorry I couldn't help you more, but ah, the understood remainder of the sentence be being, but I have to work with these men. Then he turned and walked away. Oh. <clears throat> uh, Farstad displays evidence of having much more love and reverence for the scripture than his uh, contemporaries. In his writings, he is much more jealous for God concerning inerrancy. In his book, The New King James Version in the Great Tradition, although he promotes the version 
whose translation he was chiefly responsible for, he does not exhibit the animosity or vehemence that uh, James White, Jack Lewis, or most Bible correctors display. He gives well thought out arguments in favor of Mark six nine through or sixteen nine through twenty and John seven fifty three through eight eleven. He is a great defender of the Greek text of the King James Bible, though not a prominent, uh, yeah, though not a prom as prominent of the book itself, which is sad, right? Uh, it is unfortunate that he was associated with the New King James Version, which is by no means equal to, let alone better than the King James Bible, right? Because it's still uh, trying to correct it. And then he continues on uh, with uh, this about Dr. Uh, Farstad. He says, Dr. Farstad's greatest testimony of the value of the New King James Version came during our round table discussion on the John Ankerberg show when he admitted that he didn't even think it was worth using for his personal devotions. During this broadcast, the editor-in-chief of the New King James Version admitted that he preferred to use the Latin in his daily devotions rather than the very translation that he had helped to create. Are you going to use a Bible that is that its chief editors reject? <laughs> right? So, good question there. And now we move on to uh, the next man here, Kenneth uh, Barker. And he writes here about Kenneth Barker. He says, Dr. Kenneth Barker was the head of the New International Version Committee. Dr. Barker was probably the most belligerent of the opponents of God's Word that day. He writes, uh, his attitude was mean and aggressive, fine, as long as the facts back him up, which they didn't. In fact, Dr. Uh, Barker's savior that day wasn't Jesus Christ. It was John uh, Ankerberg. Ankerberg had envisioned the King James Bible supporters going down in flames on nation, uh, nationwide television. Oh. Uh, he produced eight programs in hopes of putting the King James issue to rest once and for all while uh, hawking his own uh, NIV study Bible during uh, the commercial breaks. It didn't take long for Ankerberg to see that his glory days were failing miserably, so miserably that he himself had to interject comments and steer conversations away from the uh, embarrassingly indefensible uh, position of his Bible-rejecting uh, dream team. Oh. At one point, Brother Gipp writes, he says, at one point I nailed Barker with the inexcusable and unprofessional practice of incorrectly translating the Greek word Hebrews, that's Hebrew, as Aramaic, in every reference that dealt with it as a language, there is no authority for this travesty of translation which serves only to undergird the Roman Catholic claim that Jesus spoke Aramaic rather than Greek or Hebrew, and thus renders his statement in Matthew sixteen eighteen an affirmation of the Roman Catholic claim that Jesus founded his church on Peter rather than himself. In Greek, the word for Peter and the word for rock are two different words, but in Aramaic they are the same. Roman Catholicism is desperate to prove that Aramaic was the language of Jesus Christ. Uh, Dr. Baker and his cohorts served their Roman Catholic masters well in inventing a meaning for Hebrews, or Hebrews uh, which simply does not exist. When I confronted Baker, Brother Gip writes, uh, he says, I, when I confronted Baker uh, with his inexcusable rendering, he was speechless before the embarrassment of, that, of this infidelity to the Greek text that they hold so dear could sink into the minds of viewers. John Ankerberg interrupted and steered the conversation away from the subject. 
of Baker's great gaff was yet to come. <laughs> Bible believers make a great deal of the biblical statement on the inspiration of scripture found in Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Amen. They also are quick to point out the divine promise of preservation found in verse 7. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The reader can only imagine the untold damage this promise does to those who try to convince Christianity that there's no perfect Bible anywhere. Uh, you can also imagine the great obstacle this verse must have presented to Baker and company as they endeavored to circumvent uh, the promise or this promise and usurp the King James Bible. It should be noted at this point that the Hebrew of Psalm 12, 7 is in the third person plural, i.e. then uh, they, them. Uh, there is no manuscript in existence that reads in the first person plural, us, we. Yet with the facts of the original Hebrew staring them in the face, Barker's boobs produced the fictitious rendering of, O oh Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. Once again, I confronted Baker with this glaring example of translational incompetence accomplished by his team of competent scholars. This time, he reacted before uh, Ankerberg could ride to his rescue with a look of hatred beaming from his learned face, he stated, I believe verse 7 is referring to the poor of verse 5, not the words of verse 6. Then he leaned forward and in unrepentant defiance said, I'd never translated that like the King James way. So that's what he said there. Uh, now please understand Dr. Baker is free to interpret Psalm 12, 7 any way he pleases, but he is not free to invent a phony translation to back up his prejudice. Uh, there isn't even one manuscript that supports or even pretends to support Baker's lame claim. Uh, these men are supposed to be professional enough to lay their personal prejudice aside, their personal prejudice against the King James Bible, and do work objectively. Obviously, Baker and his crew of semi-learned men lack whatever it takes to do that. And then Brother Gip writes on here, he says, I am reminded by this unprofessional action of the vehemence with, with, or, or with which preachers uh, castigate Dr. Peter Ruckman for saying, you can correct the Greek with the English. What Dr. Ruckman is claiming is not that you can correct the original with the English, but the Greek text that we possess with the English, and there is not an honest proponent of any Greek text. Nestle, United Bible Society, or the Texas Receptus that would accept a word-for-word -word translation of their favored text into English as perfect. Therefore, the King James English, which doesn't even slavishly follow the Texas Receptus, represents what the original would read uh, like if we had it, or, yeah, if we had it here today. <clears throat> Therefore, it can shed light on the uh, minute or major errors of the extant uh, text that we possess. Yet here is the renowned Dr. Baker, who with no Hebrew authority whatsoever to support his personal beliefs, apparently believing that he can correct the Hebrew with his English. So please, where's the outcry of indignation so pre frequently leveled at Ruckman? To assault Ruckman and not Baker is, or excuse me, Barker is kin to shameless prejudice shown by the environmentalists when they bemoan an American 
Exxon Valdez oil spill and yet are strangely and hypocritically silent when a non-American Saddam Hussein deliberately pours millions more gallons of raw crude into the uh, Persian, uh, Persian Gulf. Excuse me, the Persian Gulf. Uh, could it be that critics harbor their own share of prejudice? Hmm. And so that's uh, it for uh, that man there. Next, we move on to Jack Lewis. And Brother Gip writes this about him. He says, as I rule, as I rule, I have chosen not to call people by name in my books and then call them names. Yet at this point, I am forced to say that Jack Lewis is both a deceiver and a liar. I will clearly prove my point. In uh, 1981, Baker Book House published a book by Lewis entitled The English Bible for Form KJV to NIV, A History and Evaluation. Such a title would immediately lead the reader to believe that this author has a multitude of Bible versions, 11 to be exact, and then gives the reader his objective conclusion of which are good and which are bad. Hmm. That is where Lewis is a deceiver. You need go no further than the table of contents to see this. His chapter evaluating the New English Bible is, um, is amply titled The New English Bible. The chapter concerning the NIV is similarly entitled The New International Version. Uh, thus, he objectively addresses the very various translations in his book. So what do you suppose the chapter evaluating the King James Bible is called? Well, if you thought it would be the King James Version, you were deceived. It's called Doctrinal Problems in the King James Version. Well, thus, before you even get past the table of contents, you can see that Lewis is prejudiced against the King James Bible. In fact, Lewis doesn't even ascribe doctrinal problems to the chapter evaluating the Jehovah's Witness version. It is simply called the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. He has more grace with heretics than with Bible believers. Hmm, that's pretty sad there. And continuing on, it says, What are the doctrinal problems Lewis stumbled upon? while objectively evacu evaluating the King James Bible. He gives he gives none, he writes, uh, yet he blows smoke about his dislike for the King James Bible and then defends his choice of the title for this chapter by saying doctrine means teaching and any failure to present the word of God accurately, completely, and clearly in a translation is a doctrinal problem. And then there's a little uh, note down here at the bottom. It says this is uh, 319, this note here. Uh, and this is the title here, uh, Lewis Jack P., The English Bible from KJV to NIV, a History of an Evaluation, Baker Book House, Grand Rapids, 1981, page 61. So that's that note there. And now let's continue back on to the text. And it says, I could believe that Lewis used such a loose and flimsy definition of doctrinal problems if he had entitled the other chapters the doctrinal problem in the new international version the doctrinal problem in the new american standard standard version and so on for only a deceiver would attempt to pretend that the king james bible has doctrinal problems and then further pretend to blind uh, or to be blind, so and further pretend to be blind to the clear doctrinal problems of the other modern versions. But Lewis doesn't do this because uh, Jack Lewis is a deceiver. So, so be careful of this man here. And then next he writes, but he is a, but is he a liar? Question there. Is he a liar? Yes. On page 55 of his book, he has a paragraph full of words in the King James Bible that he claims 
have passed completely out of use. Uh, these are the infamous archaic words we hear so much about. In this list, Lewis deceivingly includes uh, Talitha uh, uh, Kumai. Uh, this is not archaic, it's Aramaic. It is nothing more than a transliteration of the Aramaic words used in the passage. Once again, Lewis attempts de uh, deception, uh, but his cr crowning work is found in the same list where he states that sanctum sanctorium are words in the KJV which have passed completely out of use. Sanctum sanctorium appears nowhere here in the King James Bible. Lewis is a liar, and yet men like James White will refer to him as an authority to justify the elimination of the King James Bible. Hmm. <clears throat> and then concluding about this man, he writes, uh, Personally, I am not offended by Lewis's attempts at deception and his outright lie. I welcome them. I am always pleased to see my adversary uh, forced to actions that are plainly dishonest and insincere, for if they really believed that they were right, they would never do so. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, James, he writes. And then we have this note here, uh, note 320, and down here at the bottom of the page, I'll read this to you, and then we'll move on to Kurt uh, Allen. Uh, so here it says on uh, this note here, 320, he writes, I don't consider Bible correctors to be my personal enemies. Uh, Ross tries to make himself that, though, uh, since they seek to destroy the Bible rather than uh, me personally. I consider them my adversaries because I have chosen to confront and withstand their attacks on God's perfect Bible and refute their arguments while presenting a few of my own. I am not sure they feel the same way. I was once smacked in the face by a Bible corrector after he chose to start an argument and then lost it for all the digger de 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 derogatory excuse me for all the derogatory things Bible correctors say about the, us Bible believers I do not know of this type of thing happening in reverse so who is really mean spirited and hateful hmm. all right next let's move on to this next man here and let's see here. All right, looks like this is a little bit of a lengthy one on this man here. So let's see here. So this will conclude this part here. So let's go ahead and we'll read this here. Let's see, we're um, 22 minutes in. All right, so we'll read on him and then we'll, um, he'll be the last one we read on and then we'll end up in the King James Apocrypha and then we'll stop there. So we'll go for the rest here. This is, um, him, uh, Kurt Allen, and this talks about him from 346 to 353. So let's go ahead and continue on here and read about Kurt Allen, and that's A L A N D. And what Brother Gip writes about him, he says, Kurt Allen is probably the leading authority on Bible manuscripts alive today. He resides in his native Germany, where he is the head of the institute for New Testament textual uh, research in M Munster, uh, Westphalia. That's uh, Munster, M-U-N-S-T-E-R, with two uh, dots on top of the U. Uh, Westphalia, that's W-E-S-T-P-H-A-L-I-A, -A, Westphalia. Uh, for years, he was the co-editor of the Nestle's Novum Testamentum, uh, Gracie, until the death of Erwin uh, Nesty, uh, Ebenhard's uh, son, in 1972, when he became the controlling force for the text. He also works with the United Bible Society on the board of editors for its Greek New Testament. Allen's uh, writing is clear and forceful. He, shudder, uh, yeah, he shoulders his way into any situation and presents himself as a force to be reckoned with. It is no mere coincidence that he managed to get himself onto the editing board of both of the leading critical uh, 
uh, Greek text uh, used today. I personally enjoy the glimpses I have caught of his personality when reading his works. Brother Gibbs, right? Brother Gibbs writes, uh, his work is informative, yet overweight in scholarly claptrap. Unfortunately, he comes down on the wrong side of the fence on the issue of which Greek text is the right one. Mm. Uh, he is joined at the brain with Dan Wallace and company in their almost vicious prejudice against the Texas Receptus. Allen uh, uh, cannot mention that text without always taking a shot at it and this is uh, and or add this to the fact that there is no public um, record of his having taken christ as savior and it muddies his finding to the point of being unreliable as an authority in textual matters a brief review of his book the text of the new testament reveals the blindness that hangs over him like a veil, a veil that will not be removed until he trusts Christ and turns away from corrupting, or excuse me, from the corrupting uh, philosophy of Alexandria. What is the saddest thing about Alan is that his work reveals that he has the facts right in front of him, yet cannot interpret them correctly due to his incorrect philosophical position and the threat to his somewhat robust ego. Allen freely admits that the scribes in Alexandria altered manuscripts, yet doesn't seem the least upset about it. He states, it was assumed that in the early period there were several recessions of the text, or that at the beginning of the 4th century scholars at Alexandria and everywhere, or excuse me, and elsewhere, took as many good manuscripts as were available and applied their philosophical methods to compile a new uniform text. This was the view of our fathers and is still that of many textual critics today as well. That's what he says there. And in this note here at the bottom, Alan Kurt, the text of the New Testament, William B. Erdman's uh, Grand Rapids, 1989, page uh, 50 of that book. And then continuing on, it says here, Allen even admits that Alexandrian scholars treated the text of the New Testament so loosely that they produced a distinctly freer text than that which they started with. Quite possibly, Bishop Demetrius had manuscripts prepared for his newly recognized diocese, now under the direction of his newly appointed uh, Corpiscopoi and its uh, church in a scriptorium related to the uh, Catechetical uh, uh, School, uh, which probably existed despite the lack of any documentary evidence. <clears throat> Can you not? Uh, designing particular manuscripts, which probably were imported from other provinces of the broader church to be master exemplars, uh, uh, would have created a special Alexandrian text. And then this note here at the bottom, uh, here it says, concerning the exemplars, uh, uh, Allen refers to an exemplar, uh, is an, any manuscript form which a copy is made, excuse me, is any manuscript from which a copy is made, um, it is considered that the parent and copy, uh, and the copy is its child or offspring. Textual criticism basically seeks to follow the trail of copies back to their exemplars in a vain hope of discovering the original text. So that's that note there in the middle of the, um, verse or what he, um, what he writes here and so continuing back into the text uh, so again it says uh, designating particular manuscripts which probably were imported from other provinces of the broader church to be master exemplars would have created a special Alexandrian text but this hypothesis however in tr 
intrinsically uh, possible uh, does not square with the evidence of the manuscripts up to the 3rd, 4th century, thus page 45, 46, and 66, and a whole group of other manuscripts offer a free text, i.e. a text dealing with the original text in a relatively free manner with no suggestion of a program of standardization, or were these manuscripts also imported from elsewhere? And then, emphasis mine, he writes in parentheses. And then this note here, this is again from Alan Kurt, the text of the New Testament, William B. Erdman's Grand Rapids, 1989, page 59 of that book. So, hope you understood that um, well enough there, um, that, that uh, um, uh, Alan Kirk writes. And then, continuing on, Brother Gip continues on here. He says, it is first to be noted that Alan has great faith in a scriptorium uh, which he has no proof ever existed. Next, we need to note his admission that the manuscripts coming out of, the, of Alexandria are considered to contain a text that is freer in style than the originals. In other words, Alexandrian scholars took casual liberties in altering the text of the exemplars they used to produce a unique, uh, um, call it local text, he writes in parentheses, so a unique, call it local text. Uh, Allen further admits to this when he states, the more loosely organized a diocese, or the greater the differences between its constituent uh, churches, the more uh, likely different text types would coexist as in early Egypt. And then uh, I bid page 55 and 56 of the same book mentioned above. So continuing on, writes here, uh, how can Dr. Allen admit such slack handling of the word of God and yet uphold Alexandria as the source for the correct New Testament text? He asks, no one can be this ignorantly blind, it can only be willful. Uh, willful. So, uh, but Allen isn't finished arguing our case for us. He further admits that Christianity was concentrated in the East, Antioch, not in the West, Alexandria. And so this is what Allen says here. The overall impression is that the concentration yeah, concentration of Christianity was in the East. Churches become fewer in number as we go westward. Large areas of the West were still untouched by Christianity. Even around A.D. 325, the scene was still largely unchanged. Asia Minor continued to be the heartland of the church. And so that's what Alan said there. Uh, there are two things that are amazing about this admission. Uh, First, the church, the body of born-again believers, not the Roman Catholic organization, is the custodian of scripture, not scholarship. The dearth of churches in the West disqualifies it from being a uh, feasible location for God to use to preserve his Bible. Hmm. Secondly, Alan admits this scarcity of churches right up un uh, into the 4th century, which is the time of the creation of the famous uh, uncials of Egypt, Aleph, A, B, and C. These manuscripts were the product of professional scholars editing the original text to the tune of their personal philosophies rather than the loving reproductions of the originals which stem from the multitude of churches existing in Antioch at the time. It is estimated that there were as many as 100,000 Christians in Antioch by the end of the first century alone. While busy hijacking the text of scripture in 1874, or excuse, excuse me, 1871, Westcott and Hort all but begged their fellow revisers to believe that there had been 
a recession of scripture performed in Antioch in the 4th uh, century. They pointed out how the text of Antioch seems to literally explode into existence around this time with very few witnesses from the first three centuries. They claim that this is proof that the Byzantine text was created in Antioch about this time. This leaves Bible believers with the embarrassing position of defending a text which consists of a multitude of late witnesses while being sparse in the early centuries. How can we explain this? We don't have to. The reason for this is expertly presented by none other than Dr. Allen. And so here we go. What Dr. Allen says here, Asia Minor and Greece, the censors of early Christianity, undoubtedly exercise a substantive, if not critical, influence on the development of the New Testament text, but it is impossible to demonstrate because the climate in these regions has been unfavorable to the preservation of any papyri from the early period. And that's Ibid, page 67, from the book um, by um, um, Allen there. And then Brother Gip continues on writing. He says there, excuse me, these are not the desperate pleas of a frantic Bible believer trying to defend his favorite text, or favorite text. Uh, these are the authoritative declarations of our opposition's great voice. But Dr. Allen is not finished providing us with his expert uh, assistance. Allen clearly explains that this lack of early witnesses is due to the destruction of the Byzantine text's early witnesses during the Diocletianic uh, pers persecution of the churches of Asia Minor. And then this is what he writes here. Um, Allen writes here, he says here, but the period of persecution, which lasted almost 10 years in the West and much longer in the East, was characterized by the systematic destruction of church buildings and church centers, and any manuscripts that were found in them were publicly burned. The church officials were further required to surrender for public burning all holy books in their possession or custody, although clergy who submitted to the demands of the state were branded as traitors and defectors from the faith. Their number was by no means small. The result was a widespread scarcity of New Testament manuscripts, which became all the more acute when the persecution ceased. And that's from the same book, uh, page 65. And then continuing on, uh, Brother Gibb writes, Alan unwittingly explains why there is such an absence of early witnesses for the Byzantine Texas Receptus, Receptus text uh, prior to the 4th century, and what of the explosion of witnesses beginning with that same period, Dr. Allen continues, for when Christianity could again engage freely in missionary activity, there was a tremendous growth in both the size of the existing churches and the number of the new churches, there also followed a sudden demand for large numbers of New Testament manuscripts in all provinces of the empire. Hmm. And that again is from the uh, same book, um, page 65 again. And, and Brother Gibbs continues on here. He writes, uh, following the end of the Diocletianic, uh, persecutions, the churches in Antioch and the surrounding areas immediately began generating copies of their uh, remaining manuscripts to fill the void. Thus, we find large numbers of manuscripts appearing around this time. It wasn't the result of an orchestrated recession. It was the normal recovery uh, process of an unstoppable church. But in this single report, Allen, Allen's blind prejudice prevents him from seeing what is right in front of his face. The question screams to be asked 
if the churches in Asia Minor were curtailed and destroyed by Emperor Diocletian's uh, Bill Clinton-like tactics, why wasn't the vertibility unmolested text of Egypt hungrily embraced and copied by the remaining churches? The question is all too clear from the actions of our historic fathers. They didn't ad adapt the, the text of Alexandria, Egypt, in place of that of Antioch, because they recognized that it had been uh, corrupted by the by Egyptian philosophy, uh, while education accepted the Alexandrian text and still does, the church, the custodian of scripture, rejected it and always has. If they had thought the Alexandrian text to be a reproduction of the original text, they would have scooped it up, reproduced it fanatically, and today it would uh, predominate the number of extant manuscripts instead of numbering the mere uh, handfuls. But the church rejected the corrupt text of Alexandria, and when she saw the opportunity to reproduce and promote the text, she jumped at the fortuitous event and reproduced the correct text in huge volumes. In doing so, she proved the wisdom of God in assigning the text to her for safekeeping rather than to the whim of a bunch of Egyptian scholars, whether in the 4th century or in the 20th. Alan's blindness prevents him either from seeing this or from admitting it, but that should not come as a surprise to anyone who took note of the great omission in his book, for in over 300 and 30 pages, Allen never once refers to divine inspiration, divine preservation, or even God. He, like White, Wallace, and the rest of the educational establishment, does not view the Bible as divinely inspired or preserved. They do not see or even look for God's handiwork and its transmission across the ocean of time. Again, this is the great gulf between us and them. They are carnally minded profes uh, professionals who cannot countenance uh, the su supernatural in the preservation of a book that is received as supernatural by most of its users. They, like Westcott and Hort, treat the Bible as any other liter literary uh, work, albeit one with a large field of ancient witnesses and even larger following, what more could we expect of men uh, who think such things as First uh, Peter and Second Peter, for example, were clearly written by two different authors for completely two different occasions and were brought together only by a much later church tradition. So that's uh, Alan's words again from the book uh, that he wrote, page 49. And then Brother Gipp concludes with this. He says, I cannot, excuse me, I can understand the lack of faith that White, Wallace, Lewis, Allen, and their cohorts suffer from. They do not view the Bible as we do. They do not guard it jealously as we do. Why? It is simple. We are the church. We are an extension of the group that God established 2,000 years ago to protect and preserve his word or his book. Uh, they are the people we are protecting it from. While Allen's manner isn't as boring as Wallace's uh, cracker dust personality or as slobberingly uh, me too-ish as James White's, he still does not qualify as being someone we should turn to when looking for a, a book that we believe God wrote and that God promised to preserve so, and that's the end of uh, that topic there. And so next time we'll continue on in chapter 9, the authorized version, with this uh, subtopic titled The King James Apocrypha. So we'll go into that next time. So, uh, amen. And again, uh, let me put the book marker here. And again, this is from the um, 2004 edition of the uh, book here by Brother Gip, the Understandable 
uh, Gibbs Understandable History of the Bible. And this has been updated since then, so you can either get this copy of the book or a newer copy. And I'm sure there's probably new stuff in it that's not in this one. So um, and I'll have to get that one one of these days and maybe read it to you uh, in its entirety. But we'll continue on with this one next time. So, uh, amen. And this is in the playlist on the YouTube channel. And that YouTube channel it says Ambassador for Christ Broadcasting or typing in Baptist Bread Broadcast and look me up that way. And like and subscribe. And you can also watch the Baptist Bread broadcast. And then the other um, broadcast I do. Where I've been reading Brother James's book on uh, Genesis. Part of the Christ Honoring Commentary series. And that's in the playlist also. So, And uh, amen. So I apologize for any mistakes I read uh, um, read here when I was reading the, the text here. But I tried to pronounce these words and stuff as best I could. And uh, got a little tripped up there. A little bit, but hopefully you understand it um, well enough to to listen to me or read it. So, and of course you can always get a copy of your uh, for, of your own and read it yourself. So, amen. But uh, anyway, that's uh, going to be it for today. So, thanks for watching, and may the Lord richly bless you. Until next time, and bye bye for now.